everyone. Uh, I'm Liz Howard, and I'm the CTO at Anki.com. And uh, you may know me from Hackbrite, Galvanizer, Tradecraft. Um, I've been an engineer for about 17 years now, but in my heart of hearts, I'm a teacher, and that's what uh, that's what we do at Anki is we are educators. So I'm here to talk to you about this cool bot we made. Um, and more broadly, I'm here to talk to you about kind of the interactions that we have considered uh, for this product that we put out. You can check it out at bot.anki.com if you want to see it. So for a little bit of background, um, Anki is a learning platform. We launched about two years ago. We are an iOS and Android app, and about a million devs use us for daily learning. It's a little bit like Duolingo, but for JavaScript <laughs> and several other uh, technologies, right? Um, but we're not a content company. We are a learning platform. So our content is actually all open source, Creative Commons licensed, and it's up on GitHub. Uh, a number of educators around the world use us to teach uh, computer science, JavaScript, so on. And uh, they, they coordinate and collaborate on our GitHub repo. So um, what we've been, uh, and if you're interested, by the way, feel free to contact me afterwards. So for a while, um, Anki has been uh, used for daily learning, micro learning, these short interactions. And because our, uh, because our developers and our, 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 um, our community wants to teach people to code, and because we've been an iOS and Android app, what we've wanted to do is expand and extend our content format. And so uh, a, while, a while back, a couple of, couple of months ago, we started to really push to extend our content format and add uh, more interactive things, more, more authentic learning experiences. We wanted to add exercises and we wanted to add uh, interactions between our users because Enki was a one player experience and we wanted it to be more of a team daily learning experience. It's always more powerful when other people are involved. Um, but uh, our, let's see, can we go back? Uh, can we go back? Yeah, cool. But our, our content format is meant for the phone. It's meant to be mobile. Uh, and so it's short, and it's designed to be consumed quickly. And what we found was our users didn't want to fire up a web browser to consume about five minutes of content because the web browser feels heavy and it gets you distracted and it's not always as ideal of a short form learning environment. And so we decided to build a conversational learning platform. What we were able to do because uh, our content is all in Markdown is we were able to put uh, and tunnel our content through Slack and because Slack has these really great uh, platform features like interactive messages, we were able to keep our, our, our just those few taps that you need to interact with our content, uh, we were able to translate that into an interactive message. But more than that, we were able to add more features, features that the phone could not really support. So we were able to add exercises. Now, when we built exercises, we were faced with a choice. We could write a great deal of content to get started and we could build our own backend to do all of this stuff. Or we could look at all the different platforms that are already out there that already work and integrate with those. Now, the old adage that I'm sure you're all aware of as application developers is that you never wanna link away from your application. You never wanna send users anywhere else because if you send someone else so if you send a user somewhere else in the browser, they're gone. You'll never see them again. They'll never come back. Your funnel will drop off and your manager will get really mad at you. So, uh, we, but we wanted to be able to do that because education is not a zero sum game. It's not about capturing all of the user's attention. It's about making them learn, right? So um, what we were able to do by integrating with Slack and creating a conversational learning platform was we were able to link out to documentation, external resources. We were able to bring in learning content from all around the web and deliver it in that short daily format that Anki is already really good at. Um, so with Slack apps, we are 
freer to be more collaborative. We can do things like integrate with platforms that already exist um, and keep users within the ecosystem because users will return to Slack when they are done interacting. It's a different program, it's a different application, and they're constantly drawn back to Slack. So we can link around, we can integrate, and we can be more friendly. Um, the thing that Slack allows you to do is drive traffic rather than just consuming traffic. But we can also be very intentional about how much, how much attention of the users do we take up at a time. Micro learning is great because you can kind of start and stop and it's short little things, but sometimes in order to get real depth and really understand something, you really have to think about it. What have I learned? What have I, what have I um, absorbed from this? And so with Slack dialogues, we are able to command all of a user's attention for just a few fields and then kick them back into the app and they're back to Slack and they don't feel like they've been captured or, or sent off somewhere. So Slack's platform for us was a very powerful, um, powerful and uh, well situated to our, our interaction model and our content. But Slack is more than just another notifications channel. A lot of the applications that, and Slack bots and things and integrations that we have seen are really just saying, okay, Slack is another notifications channel. Users pay attention to Slack messages more than they pay attention to iPhone notifications. So we'll just put our integration into Slack and it'll basically be our app, but not, you know. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not about that. Slack is about relationships. Slack is where relationships live. So the big idea that we had was to turn our product into a, a multiplayer experience. Um, what we wanted to do was incentivize learning and incentivize mentorship. Uh, Slack is the normal context for asking for help, receiving help, asking questions, answering questions, helping your coworkers, and building relationships. So by putting our, putting our whole system into Slack and creating user relationships and managing those relationships, what we do is we turn our content ecosystem into, um, into a connected ecosystem between humans. So the big takeaway here is that when you are building a bot, you are not building a pretend human. You are not trying to create a facsimile of a human being. What you're doing is you're creating a partnership. Uh, bots are here to help users interact. They're to drive conversations and not to drive, and not to pretend to be humans, right? So bots are good at, at specific things and humans are good at a different set of things. I'm sure this is not news to you, but let's kind of build a mental model of what is it that bots are good at versus humans. The first one is reminders. Bots are amazing at reminders. They will always message you properly at 7 p.m. as long as you get the time zone right. Um, but humans can learn. Humans can adapt to a new interface, a change. Humans can deal with minute uh, details being off. Um, and humans can help correct things or note when things are wrong. And bots cannot do those those things. Bots can't tell if you're almost right or right. Um, but bots are so good at creating feedback loops. If you've read The Power of Habit or any of those other books about feedback loops, they're very powerful and they really help users. Um, and if what you're trying to do is create a learning habit in someone, a bot is really wonderful. Um, but bots are not good at feedback. Uh, there's a reason why comment sections first sprang up on the internet and they were just free form entry fields, right? They weren't for computers to use, um, but now we have spam bots. <laughs> but humans, humans are good at giving feedback. Humans are good at looking at something and saying whether or not it's good or bad or where it's weak or where it's strong. Um, 
Bots are better at data. They're better at the quantitative feedback, right? How many exercises did you do? Are you keeping to your, your habits? Are you giving enough feedback? Are you getting enough feedback? They can keep track of the quantitative information, but humans can do the squishy stuff, ans answering questions, right? Um, you know, uh, and bots are for coordinating humans, right? Bots are to help know if humans are getting the things done, help them remind each other about things. But humans have to ask the why, the what. Are we doing this right? Do you really understand? And so in order to create a really effective bot and in order to create a really compelling sort of multiplayer experience, what you have to do is you have to create incentives uh, that are based on the esteem of others the esteem of the humans uh, in your Slack channel. That's what you really care about when you see these reports and things. But humans are, are scare, a scarce resource. We can recruit humans to do the things that bots cannot do, but their time is, is valuable and their focus is valuable. It's easily shattered, where a bot is always available. You can send it something and it doesn't have to get back to what it's doing and remember. And so. Um, humans can, you know, humans can't always be there to always answer your question right when you need it, right? They're not as available, but they are emotionally sensitive. If you ask a question and that question is just formed incorrectly, they can note that you're agitated, that you're confused, um, where a bot will just say, I'm sorry, the query is wrong. I don't understand, you know? So when you want to build these, these systems uh, and you want to build relationships and foster and, and augment relationships with a bot, remember what a bot is good at versus what a human is good at. Bots are really for content delivery, and humans are supposed to do the problem solving. That is their job. Um, and so you can enlist those users to do those things that are related to problem solving rather than having a computer do them. So the big takeaway here is that your bot should solve the people problems. If they live in Slack, it's, it's about a relationship. It's not so much about a notification. A notification can help two people to make a decision, but a notification is not the be all end all. It's to drive offline behavior and it's to drive human interactions. So to kind of look at a people problem that our bot is trying to solve. Um, there's the issue of silos in larger organizations. I'm sure most of the people in this room have experienced silos being a big problem. Your product team doesn't talk to the front end dev team enough, or if the data team needs to make a change, or the marketing team needs to make a change, they have to go through the product team. And they, these people really only interact to throw things over the wall and kind of say that that's you know, your problem. The idea of creating a bot um, is to pop those bubbles, to, to break down those walls. That's the whole point of Slack. And so let's imagine that you have a data team, right? And that data team is bombarded with requests. The, data, the marketing team needs to know how many users did this thing, and, and you know, the back-end dev team needs them to change the way that they're comp computing something because it's blocking the database. But without talking, it's just that those people, they just see the, you as a team who's doing things wrong and not the way that we want, right? But let's say that we want to create some things between, some, some mentorship relationships between the marketing team and the data team. If the data team mentors on SQL and the marketing team mentors on writing, what happens is these users generate respect for each other. They realize that what the marketing team is good at is a different set of skills than what the data team is good at. And by sharing those skills, they empower each other so that the data team is not bombarded with a million requests. The marketing team is thankful for, to the data team. And the data team is thankful to the marketing team that their, that their work and their ideas are written up properly. So these mentorship relationships can really create a lot, right? If your data team mentors your backend team on machine learning and backend you know, mentors the data team on performance, you're going to have better applications that run better. The marketing team helps the back-end team with their documentation and the promotion, that things are changing in the organization. The back-end dev team usually doesn't know very much about internal marketing. And so there are so many 
opportunities for mentorship in an organization. And to build something around that, um, what we've done is we've really thought, how do we, how do we build multiplayer experiences, right? In a channel, this report uh, that you know, recognizes the top learning team basically creates an incentive for not only for your team to, to learn every day, but also to mentor, to have one-on-ones, to interact. And because other people would see this report, people who are not featured in the report, the top learning team gains esteem, gains respect from the organization. And so others are encouraged to do so. Others are rewarded with esteem of their own if they follow the example of Sandra and her team. So the, the big takeaway here is we have tried to create a, a, a product that lives natively in Slack that drives relationship building and rewards it, incentivizes it, tracks it, encourages it, helps, helps mentors do something that they're likely already doing but structures it and augments it. And that's sort of the, the main idea here is that the point is the offline behavior that you are driving. These conversations are the product. Your application really just incepts these flows. And that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks.